We're going to be in Ruth chapter 3 this morning. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to follow along. If you don't have your Bible, then there should be one under a seat somewhere near you. If you can't find one, ask a neighbor to help you out or share with someone. Ruth chapter 3. Entitled the message this morning, The Proposal. As we've talked about this um, beautiful love story, the, um, the story of Ruth is a love story. But it is more than just a love story between Ruth and Boaz, as he has been introduced already. The story of Ruth is a picture of this unfathomable love of God in the way that these two are brought together um, in, in God's providence and in God's plan, as it just so happens, right? Some background if you're just jumping in with us this morning into Ruth chapter 3. Um, so chapter 1 is a really sad chapter, one of the most depressing chapters in the Bible. All of these bad things have happened to Ruth and Naomi. They are um, an Orpah as well. Uh, uh, Naomi is uh, Ruth's mother-in-law, and she um, loses her husband. He dies. There's also their... Uh, uh, Ruth and Orpah's husbands, her, Naomi's sons, they die. There's a famine in the land. They've moved out of Israel. They've uh, out of the place where God has said to bless and to um, provide for His people. And so all of the, this turmoil is happening in Ruth chapter 1. And because of the, the culture and the setting in which all of this is taking place, uh, this, is, this is a dreadful thing for them, understanding that uh, without a male in the family. They have no ability to conduct business. They have no authority. There's no, um, uh, there's no one to carry on this family name. And so it's a very, um, uh, just a, a frowned upon, very um, tragic situation in the culture that uh, this is taking place in. And so uh, Naomi and Ruth decide they will go together. Ruth clings to Naomi. She says, I will make your God my God. I mean, your people my people. And she goes back um, to uh, Bethlehem with Ruth, or with Naomi. And there they try to make a life for themselves. They're kind of, uh, Ruth is working. She's kind of gathering, gleaning. She's, uh, as the, uh, uh, the, those without uh, means would do, they would follow the those that were gleaning the field and anything left behind, they were able to gather. And in this process, as they're gathering, Ruth meets Boaz. And uh, meeting Boaz is an exciting thing because Boaz gives Ruth a lot of food, which really answers their first problem, right? They needed to find food. And so Boaz is an answer to that first problem is food. The second problem that they're trying to address is family. And as she gets back to, to share with Naomi all that Boaz has done, the um, incredible blessing of the resources that have been given, there's um, just that, uh, that kind of that hopefulness that's in the tone of what is taking place in the book of Ruth as she returns to Naomi, and then Naomi tells Ruth that Boaz is actually a kinsman redeemer, or a kinsman. And so, um, as all of this story starts to come together. You're getting excited. You're hopeful in that they have food. Now they have, they have identified a family. And you get to the end of chapter 2, and it ends, and she lived with her mother-in-law. And that's how we left off last week. It's like this um, triumphant uh, dud, right? It's like, a oh, yay, all this stuff is going great. And then she's living with her mother-in-law. It's like, oh, oh, okay. So that brings us into... Ruth chapter 3. All right. So let's pray, and then we'll read chapter 3. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that you give us the opportunity this morning to study your word, the opportunity to think about the love that you've ex extended towards us, the the loving kindness that you have shown towards us, God, that is patient and merciful and gracious, faithful, true. God, it is a, a comforting thought to know that you love us 
And this morning, I pray that you would bring these thoughts to our mind as we think about how we are to apply the truths of this text. I pray that you would give us uh, wisdom and uh, understanding as we seek to apply these things. I pray that uh, you would guide us in, uh, in our study. I pray that your spirit be at work to bring about conviction if we need conviction and encouragement if we stand in need of encouragement. I pray that you would um, help us to set aside anything that may be distracting to our thoughts, anything that may be um, vying for our attention. I pray that you would help us to give you the attention that you are worthy of this morning as we seek to worship you, as we humble ourselves before your word. Help me to say the things that you want me to say. Help me to say it clearly. I pray that you would make it easy for us to understand and apply. Help me not to say anything foolish this morning that would distract from the truth of your word. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope we're done with that fuzz that keeps coming through that. Yeah, just think of it as the ocean. Jesus taught by the shore, and so we can do that's the We're setting the... I think we're okay. All right, so Ruth, chapter 3. Jumping right in to this, again, this epic love story. In verse 1, it says, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? Now it is... Now is not Boaz our kinsman with whose maids you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. It shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down. That's strange to us. Then he will tell you what you should do. She said to her, all that you say, I will do. All right, this morning I'm going to stop right there, okay, because there's like weird things that are happening already that we need to kind of address. All right, um, so the first thing this morning we see just straight up is the instruction from Naomi. Naomi cares about Ruth. She wants to see that Ruth has uh, someone to provide and protect and care for her. And so she says, look, this is an eligible, eligible bachelor, Boaz, and, and you um, should pursue him. And so uh, Naomi, desiring to find Ruth a home, she, in verse 2, reminds us that Boaz is a kinsman. And remember that uh, there was this provision within Israel. If, if someone were to die without producing uh, someone to carry on the name, then there would be the next in line, the next closest um, male that would produce an heir for that, uh, that brother or that, um, uh, that family member that wasn't able to um, produce a son and so that that family name would be able to continue on, okay? So with that came some responsibilities. And um, so there's this idea that um, here there's the reminder of Boaz being the kinsman as uh, that's significant because in the story, that's what Ruth and Naomi are excited about. That's what they need is someone that can... Uh, come in as a, a kinsman and produce, help them produce in, uh, someone in the line to continue this family line. Okay? Um, and what Naomi tells Ruth to do is to wash herself, anoint herself, and to put on her best clothes. And uh, I don't think it's that uh, Ruth was a particularly smelly lady or that there was something wrong with the way that she presented herself. But uh, this is, in, in some ways, this anointing of oil and this putting on the best clothes, it would signify that the, the time of mourning has passed and that they are moving past that time of mourning. And you see this in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 20 when David is mourning over the, uh, his son and his son's death. And then when he decides it's time to move on, then he anoints himself, he puts on fresh clothes, and he moves forward. I think that's what's going on here with Ruth. And uh, Naomi's encouragement of Ruth is like, look, you've, you've mourned long enough. Your husband's been dead and gone. Now you should just present yourself as someone that is eligible. 
and able to um, be pursued by Boaz. That's what's happening as she tells her to clean herself up. And in verse 4, this is where things get intense. All right? This is where it gets very intense. Um, Upon reading these words in the culture of the day, the reader would have been uh, in some ways embarrassed. They they could have started blushing as they read these words being, uh, being presented to them. Okay? So, this is intense. I'm building suspense right now because it's so intense we can't even understand it. Number one, Naomi gives her this information, and she says, all right, so this is what you're going to do. You're going to go and find Boaz. You're going to watch him. She's like a little stalker, right? She's kind of hanging out in the corner, and she's watching him as he's doing his work, as they are, as he is in the, at the threshing floor. And the way that the thing would work was when it came time to thresh their grain, they, um, they would make appointments to go to the threshing floor. And so uh, Ruth... Uh, was able to know exactly when he was going to be there. Naomi knew when he was going to be there because of his appointed time to go and thresh. And so she says, look, this is where he's going to be. And so make yourself ready. And uh, then she says, watch, and it will be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies. She's like, look, don't mess this up, okay? You want to make sure you get the right guy, okay? If you lay down at the wrong guy, this is a big problem, all right? So she points this out for Ruth, and she says, all right, when you, when you find where he lays down, you take note of that, and uh, you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will tell you what you shall do. All right, so second thing, uncover his feet and lie down. Now, these um, basically three words in the Hebrew are the, the three key words here, are the feet or the legs to lie down. Um, they are filled with these sexual overtones. And so the readers, as they read this, their minds begin racing, right? Now remember, in the time of judges, each man did what was right in his own eyes, and immorality was something that was rampant. And so this would have been like, a, oh no, what's going to happen here? But notice in the text, and from what we see um, of the character of Ruth and Boaz, there is no immoral act that is recorded in these deeds, okay? No immoral act. So what the author is trying to convey is the intensity of this moment without any immorality that takes place in this moment, okay? There's no, no sin, no, uh, as some commentators, uh, more liberal commentators, they say, oh, this is when uh, Boaz and Ruth, they uh, got together and that's what happened. No, that's, that's not what happened in this text, okay? But what we do see is that there's this intensity to this text, all right? I'm trying to convey the intensity of this text by pointing out the, the, the way that these things are phrased, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, no immoral acts are in this, in this deed, okay? So Ruth is obedient. Not only is she obedient for her sake, but she's also obedient for Naomi's sake. And she goes and she does all... She says, all that you say, I will do. And so this instruction for Naomi is given. And then the second thing we see this morning is Ruth's proposal. So this is what's happening as all of this is unfolding, as she uncovers his feet and as she lies down. Verse 6, so she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain And she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. It happened in the middle of the night. The man was startled and bent forward. And behold, a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. Then he said, May you be blessed. Now this is important, okay? Verse 10 and 11 give us the indication of what this meant, okay? Then he said, May you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether rich, whether poor or rich. So he understands what's being proposed here. 
Verse 11, Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask for all my people in the city. Know that you are a woman of excellence. Okay? So, verse 6, Ruth listens to Naomi. She lays at Boaz's uncovered feet. And as we mentioned, this is the provocative language. However, there's nothing here that calls into question the morality of Ruth or the character of Boaz. But this scene is intense. Okay? Boaz was startled, it says in verse 8, as he discovers Ruth at his feet. You can kind of picture Ruth laying there. I don't, I don't imagine she was asleep, right? <laughs> I imagine her just waiting. What's, what's going to happen now? At what point is he going to notice that I'm here? And um, there, there comes a point where he is startled, and he wakes up, and he says, Who are you? Who are you? I wonder, as she lay there, if she was listening to him, I wonder if he was snoring, right? What kind of a sleeper was Boaz, right? What's going on? Why would she go and uncover his feet and lay down? Well, this was a Near Eastern custom to show a desire to marry someone, okay? Which we see that Boaz got the point. Verse 10, he gets the point, right? Oh, I see you haven't gone after young men and you... You haven't, whether they're poor or they're rich, but you're, he's flattered in many ways. He's surprised that she would come before him and say, hey, I, there's some interest here. I would like to marry you, Boaz. And this is a, a surprising thing. Okay, so Ruth responds as he says, who are you? And um, that's a funny question, right? Uh my wife says it's probably because it was dark. I don't know if it was dark or if it's just the response of being startled out of his sleep. You know, who are you? You know, um, maybe it's one of those things where um, uh, there have been times when, uh, not my wife, but I'm sure women have come out in their mask, their face mask, their mud mask, and the husband says, "Who are you?" You know, that kind of thing. I don't think that's necessarily what's going on. I think it's just his this uh, spontaneous response of what's going on. The, who are you? And so she reveals who she is. I am Ruth, your maid. And she says, so spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. Now, as I mentioned, this is very intense. She has put herself out there. She is risking rejection. She is risking him calling this into attention of other people. This, this could be a big, a big deal. And she could ruin, this at this point, right, all hope of the family name to continue on. Like, this could mess it up. She's putting herself out there. And she says, spread your covering over your maid. Spread your covering over your maid. Why would Ruth say, spread your covering over your maid? Well, what she's doing is she's bringing to our, our attention, or she's bringing to Boaz's attention, something that he has said previously, prior to this event. In Ruth chapter 2, the exact same word, the phrase uh, phrasing is used in verse 12. When Boaz kind of gives this pronouncement or this prayer. He says, May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. And now, Ruth seeks refuge. She seeks protection. She seeks provision from Boaz. The word wings in chapter 2, verse 12, is the same word as translated in verse 9 of chapter 3 as covering. And so what she's doing is she's saying, Boaz, you remember how you pronounced that over me, that I was seeking the Lord as he was going to be a protection for me? She says, you have that opportunity to be the protection for me. God has provided a way for us to have this protection. Let me just remind you, as you think through the, the story of Ruth, that we don't have a whole lot of... Um, definitive of what, you know, this is God and this is what God does, etc. But what you see in the story as it unfolds is the character of God. And so I think that what you're seeing as, you, as we go through this story is that the character of God is seen in this story through, through the people in the story. Okay, so be thinking about that. So just Ruth has made her intentions incredibly clear, and now Bo... Uh, 
Boaz, is given the opportunity to be the provision from God to this family. Now, do you understand what just happened? What just happened? A woman just proposed to a man. That's a, that's a unique thing in our culture. Very unique in theirs, right? Didn't happen. Not a normal thing. There was a provision for it. According to the Mosaic Law, that whenever this, this kind of a scenario was there, then the woman in need could propose these types of things. So it was allowed, but it was an unusual thing. Okay? How unusual that a woman would propose to a man. Secondly, not just a woman, but a Moabite woman would propose to a Jewish man. How in the world? This is so strange. Not just a Moabite woman, but a younger Moabite woman just proposed to a Jewish man. It's crazy. And Boaz, he responds in this way. May you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. He is tender and careful with her. He is shocked that she would be willing to be his wife. And so she goes through this act of putting herself out there because this is so unusual. This is an unusual thing, scenario. She makes it abundantly clear that she is available and happy to be married to this man, Boaz. So he acknowledges her kindness. He responds, acknowledging her kindness, calms her mind. He identifies a problem. He sends Ruth away with a gift. He acknowledges her kindness. He gives a favorable response. He's stunned that she's wanting to marry him. And then verse 11, he calms her mind. You know, she's probably just waiting on, on the edge. Like, what's he going to say? Do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask. For all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. You are a woman of excellence. Have you ever heard that phrase before? A woman of excellence? Well, it shows up in Proverbs 31. It shows up other places as well, but in Proverbs 31, there's this woman of excellence that is mentioned. I'm going to go to Proverbs if I can find it. Proverbs 31, verse 10. It says, an excellent wife, who can find? For her worth is far above jewels. And as you go through this Proverbs 31, this is the, the Proverbs 31 woman, right? There's all of these things that she does. She's a hard worker. She can make clothes. She can make food. She can make money. She's just an industrious woman, and yet she loves her family. And all of this list of things that happen in Proverbs 31. What I think is really interesting and, and cool, just I'll just give you like a little cool tidbit, okay? Um, what's interesting is that it, as you go through that list of the Proverbs 31 woman, as a woman reads that, it's kind of a, an intense, like, how do I even a, attain that kind of level of uh, uh, godliness? And I, what's really interesting is that in the, um, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, they would have arranged the books differently. And the way that they would have arranged the books would be with Ruth coming after the book of Proverbs. Do you know why they would do that? Because it gave an example of what a woman of excellence looked like. And what you see is this woman Ruth that you can much more easily relate to as she is just going about her work. She is, she is industrious. She is faithful. She is humble, she's committed, she's dependable, etc. And so she, she fulfills all of these things, and yet she still takes breaks. She's still a person, right? She's still someone that has to stop for food, wants some water, all of those kinds of things that this other woman in Proverbs 31, it seems like, whoa, how do you even do what she's doing? So in the Hebrew Bible, they put Ruth right after the book of Proverbs to give an example of this excellent woman, all right? It's cool that this woman, Ruth, she is well spoken of 
in the city. The people know who she is, as well as this excellent woman in Proverbs 31. It concludes with the, the verse 31. It says, Give her the product of her hands, and let her works praise her in the gates. Her works praise her in the gates. The people know who she is. They know her reputation. They know how great she is. And Boaz says the exact same thing of this woman, Ruth. A woman of excellence. The people in the city, they know that you are a woman of excellence. All right? There's just a little bit of extra information. And so he calms her mind. He also identifies a problem. There's someone else. There's a closer relative. Verse 12 through 13 continues. Now it is true, I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Remain this night, and when morning comes, if he will redeem you, good. Let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you. As the Lord lives, lie down until morning. And so Boaz says, look, there's this other one, and uh, I'm sure this was probably something that was on Boaz's mind, and uh, he probably already knew, like, okay, this is, this is the next obstacle that we have to get past for me to be with Ruth. And so, verse 14 continues. So she lay at his feet until morning and rose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Again, he said, give me the cloak that is on you and hold it. So she held it and he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did it go, my daughter? And she told her all the man had done for her. She said, these six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said, do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then she said, wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest until he has settled it today. Right? He's not going to rest. Boaz wants to figure this out. And so he's going after that next, next uh, closest kinsman. And the excitement of uh, this whole chapter... Um, is there in verse 17. So he sends Ruth away with this gift. They arrive, uh, they arose early. Boaz told Ruth to keep things a secret. Again, um, just wanting to protect her character, I think. He's wanting to make sure that her character isn't tainted by this. And uh, so he sends Ruth away with this gift. He says, look, give me your cloak. Give me, and he gave her six measures of barley, and he laid it on her. This was about double what she gleaned before. Before it was, what, 30 to 45 pounds, something like that, 30 to 40 pounds. So she's like 60 to 80 pounds, all right? This is heavy. He's like, look, you can't pick it up off the ground. I'll just lay it on top of you. So he's just like laying it on her shoulders. Maybe she's carrying it in her front. Maybe she's trying to throw it over her back. She's a burly woman, right? <laughs> she's, she's, I mean, she's getting it done, right? And uh, so she grabs all of this and she takes it back to our house and uh, to share with Naomi. And um, he did all this and uh, we find out why as it leads up to that moment of verse 17. And that is part of the excitement of this chapter, um, which is why I think the author builds up to verse 17. And it doesn't tell you all of this information because... You know, earlier in the story, they could say, oh, yeah, Boaz, Boaz gave this uh, barley to her, and this is why he gave it to her. But that part is left out until the very end of this section. So Naomi is waiting at home in suspense. She's probably pacing back and forth, you know, waiting for her daughter-in-law to get home, eager to hear how things went. And when she comes in, verse 16, she says, how did it go, my daughter? Or maybe even a better translation would be, who are you, my daughter? Why would she say, who are you, my daughter? I think what Naomi, Naomi is asking, whether Ruth will be an Israelite or not, in some sense. Who are you? What happened last night? It was, was it an acceptable exchange? Was it something that was favorable, or did he reject you? And she says, this is what he said, Do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Gave me all of this barley. I brought it back because he didn't want you to be empty-handed. 
And do you remember where we find this idea of being empty-handed before in the book of Ruth? Do you see the, the things that are happening as the, as the book of Ruth continues to, as the story unfolds? You see things that were um, bad in the beginning, God changing it to be something that was good. In chapter 1, verse 21, this is what Naomi says of herself. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. She says, why do you call me Naomi? Why do you call me pleasant? Since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. She says, just call me bitter. I went out full and I came back empty. Now what has Boaz done? He says, look, don't go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Her hands aren't empty anymore. God has made a way for providing for this family, giving Ruth and Naomi the food that they need and the protection that they need to be able to gather that food. And, and then you see that, that excitement and the, the romance, the, the love, the willingness between Ruth and Boaz. So Ruth, she comes back not only with grain, but with a reminder that Naomi's hands are not empty. A reminder that God has been at work. This is a reminder for us, right? When it seems like God is far from us, it may be that He's just setting things up for His provision to be seen. Does He ever seem far from you? How... How, how is this going to be put together? What do I do with this? Uh, my life is a huge question mark. It's a mess. It may be that God is putting these things there so that as He works, His provision is seen. So God is at work in the, in the emptiness, in the brokenness, in the, the time of trial. These women, they had been married to their husbands for 10 years and they still hadn't had a child. Now their husbands were dead. Mother-in-law, Naomi, her husband, the patriarch of the family, he's dead. It's emptiness. What do they have now? God has been at work not just to redeem Ruth, but there's a much bigger picture that's going on here. We get into that in chapter 4. Now, this is a love story of redemption, and even though these, these people are um, not perfect, we can see very much God's work and the way that He loves and takes care of His people. His love towards them is pure, it is just, it gives life, it is redemptive. You think about the way that, as I mentioned earlier, the way that the world portrays love, and it is so broken. When we think of the, the, the love that is portrayed within movies, right? The stories that are told, even Shakespeare, right? The two that love each other, they die, right? How great is that love? Are these little tricky love triangles and the different stories that are told. People are out to get what's good for them. There's immorality that's involved. There's this, uh, this greed that's involved. Do you know where the... Let me just tell you for a minute. Um, Genesis chapter 19. Do you know where the Moabites come from? Let me point out something else that God is doing. In Genesis chapter 19... We have this story. It is a, a broken, messed up story. Right? Another reason why I don't think anything happened with Ruth and Boaz, because the Bible doesn't mince words whenever bad things happen, right? It just lays it out for you, okay? In Genesis chapter 19, we see the beginning of the Moabite people. Verse 30. Lot went up from Zoar and stayed in the mountains and his two daughters with him. 
for he was afraid to stay in Zoar, and he stayed in a cave, he and his two daughters. This is after Sodom and Gomorrah, all the uh, devastation, death, uh, the judgment of God that's poured out on those cities because of their immorality. Verse 31 continues, Then the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man on earth to come to us after the manner of the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and let us lie with him, that we may preserve our family through our father. Now, there's some, there's some themes that you can even see through Genesis 19 that run through the, the story of Ruth, right? You have these two women that are trying to find an heir, right? And the story of this man who, after he has eaten and drink, and you're going to go and propose these things to him. And as this proposed, this is what happens in this, this story of Lot. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and let us lie with him, that we may preserve our family through our father. So they made their father drink wine. That night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. And the following day, the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay last night with my father. Let us make him drink wine tonight also. Then you go in and lie with him, that we may preserve our father through our, preserve our family through our father. So they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus, both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name, what? Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. As for the younger, she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the sons of Ammon to this day. Both of those people groups warring with Israel constantly, um, creating so much trouble. And what happens in this story is so different than what happens with Ruth and Boaz. Ruth goes and presents herself not to be immoral, but she presents herself to make herself available. She says, all right, God, if this is what you're going to do, I'm going to put myself here and we're going to see what happens. This man seems to be a man of God, and so we're going to see how he handles this. The daughters of Lot, they say, no, we're going to take this into our own hands. We're going to make this happen. We're going to preserve our family. Producing the Moabites. How gracious is God to then weave a Moabite into this story. The story of Ruth. A Moabite woman, a woman who is redeemed, brought into Israel. There's a reason, there's a, there's a difference in this story because there's a difference in the type of love that is expressed in these stories. There's an immorality in that love of Lot's daughters wanting to take care of things, take matters into their own hands. They're going to do what they want to do. I have to stop talking so I can get back to Ruth. So they have this idea of what they're going to do what they want to do. Ruth says, you know what? I'll do whatever God wants me to do. I'll follow. I told Naomi I was going to follow her. Her people were going to be my people, and her God was going to be my God, and so I'm going to pursue their God. We don't really know a whole lot of what these people looked like. I think there's a reason behind that. It's because this love isn't based off of what Ruth looked like or what Boaz looked like, but we're wanting... The author wants us to understand that there's a love that is deeper than what is seen. And that God is at work in bringing these people together. I was joking around with my wife and told her that Ruth was probably a large woman. And I told her because in order to carry that much grain, her, her shawl would have had to be pretty big, right? And so she was probably very broad. And it was probably that when she laid down at Boaz's feet, he said, oof! And woke up and was starting. Not just kidding. <laughs> nah. The thing is, we don't know what she looked like, and there's a reason for that. It's because the love between Boaz and Ruth is a love of choice. Boaz says, "No, I'm. I want to marry her, and I'm going to pursue her." And Ruth says, "No, I'm going to choose to follow Naomi's God, and I'm going to love Naomi's God. And I'm going to do whatever He calls me to do." God's love is pure, it is just, 
that gives life, that is redemptive. And this is the love that we're able to enjoy and experience. Not to take things, these characters, too far out of context or, or to um, extrapolate this out too far, but in many ways, Boaz becomes an example of the character of God and the way that he deals with Ruth. And in many ways, the, the kindness, the, the way that Ruth deals with Boaz and with Naomi is a picture of the way that God deals with us. This morning, my application, my encouragement, my challenge is that, number one, if you find yourself empty-handed, know that God is doing something. It is in those moments when we are empty-handed when God surprises us and does things that draw our attention to His provision, His protection. Secondly, this morning, my application would be rejoice in the love that God has shown to you. It is not because of the way that you look that He loves you. It is not because of the things that you do that He loves you. He loves you because He has chosen to love you. We rejoice in that, don't we? Mm -hmm. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful that you have chosen to love us. That you have given us the opportunity to know you. Or to know you. And that you have, um, through this story of Ruth and Boaz, brought to our attention the the loving kindness that's been extended to us. Through the story, you brought to our attention the way that you work when uh, there's so many things that we don't understand. Father, we are grateful that you are God and that you have a plan and that your plan is best, that your plan is to bring about our greatest good and your greatest glory. Father, we rejoice in that. Father, I pray that if this morning someone is wrestling with having empty hands, trying to figure out what, what next, how to, how to follow you, what, what plan you have purposed for them, God, I pray that you would give them wisdom and discernment. I pray that you would help them to be at peace, knowing that you are greater than any emptiness that we may face. I pray that they would find rest and joy in you, knowing that they are loved with an everlasting love, with a love that is beyond our own comprehension. God, we are so thankful that you made known to us what love is through your Son. We know that you loved us so much that you sent your Son into the world to die for us so that we might have everlasting life, a hope of being with you. Father, we rejoice in that today. Help us when we find ourselves struggling to see what you're doing. Thank you that you love us even in our struggle. May you be glorified through us, through our desire to respond in a way that is loving towards you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.